I had a call from my manager. I guess this came in a roundabout fashion. And I think we both received individual calls. Mm. Uh, but uh, the essence of it was, how would you like to uh, work with David? And I said, I'll give it some thought. And anyway, it came to, to be that we decided to meet up in uh, New York. I'll pass you over to David here, because mm. his situation is slightly different. Well, I was languishing in the Bastille for a period of time of uh, all the peripherals of rock business with uh, coming towards the end of, uh, well, going into the uh, 1990 with Whitesnake. I'd had quite enough, thank you. The moose abuse had actually gotten to me. And uh, there was an assortment of reasons that I wanted to take a, a reflective period away from what is called the music business. We met in March, uh, the end of March in New York, where we actually stopped traffic when we went for a walk, which was a blast and got on terrifically well, agreed, and uh, really uh, we covered a great deal in a short space of time, uh, and the, the most important agreement would, would be that we would take everything one step at a time. It was obvious we got on very well together. The next step was to find out whether we could actually write together. At that point of time, I was certainly uh, looking to work with a, you know, in a collaboration, certainly. This became a partnership as such, though, rather than just a... Mm you know, a casual thing. Uh, Jimmy and I have a great deal in common uh, in terms of the, the library of music which has influenced us and we can still draw upon, particularly the blues. Yeah. Um, and obviously a passion for rock. We bumped into each other in the past on possibly almost a handful of occasions. Literally. Yes, <laughs> Us usually in a club here or there in a town where both our respective bands may have been, but. Uh, uh, at no point did we ever appear on the same bill on a festival or anything like that, or jam together. So it was, you know, just for the casual mm. meetings, totally informal. All, all of the demos uh, for the songs that we made together, I think, was the extravagant cost of $50 from Radio Shack. It was a little, uh, what they call a ghetto blast or whatever. In essence, we, uh, we sat down with acoustic guitars and this extravagant recording device and literally just teased tunes out of each other, worked on things, one thing led to another in terms of li uh, riffs or chord sequences and stuff. It was an absolute bonding of two, uh, well, I'd like to think craftsmen. There are a lot of acoustic uh, guitar demos without any doubt, but the very first one that we did was uh, um, through, through an amp, an electric mm. guitar through an amp, and, and we had a, a tape of some drums. It wasn't even a drum machine. I mean, this is real primitive stuff we're talking about. The original. But the first stuff. number to come out of this uh, collusion between the two of us was, uh, on the very first day, was Absolution Blues. And we pretty much got the whole structure of that together in the first day, mm. plus some other ideas that were coming out. And these ideas were just pouring out over that first it's week. terrific. You know? They were just coming so, so fast, we said, well, let's get this down, let's get this down. And then we came back and finessed them and, mm. and rearranged them. And we didn't go in with any preconceived notions, actually. And, and as I was describing previously about the uh, Absolution Blues, that's just a, a lick that just came out of thin air, as did many of the subsequent licks which followed and called sequences and riffs. I, I did have a few bits and pieces tucked away from the past, but... Uh, um, I only really plundered a couple of those, you know, for my old demos I'm talking about. Um, because most of it was just coming out fresh, so there was no necessity to, to sort of, uh, you know, scratch one's head and think, oh, what are we going to be doing next? It was just pouring out. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely no frustrating times. The song Pride and Joy, which uh, is the first video uh, from the, the Coverdale Page album, 
I came off, I had an introductory riff, which I thought would be rather jolly to present to his royal darkness. And uh, after he'd uh, paid me the compliment of visiting Tahoe, I said, OK, it's, it's up to you to pick a, pick a place for us to go. Because, I mean, I think we'd pulled all the vibes out of Mother Nature up there. And we'd run out of movies as well, I think, at the time. <laughs> so he, uh, who, should be who shall be obeyed, picked Barbados. So initially, that song was called Barbados Boogie. And of course, instead of this lovely, charming, lilting, hoedown, toe-tapping piece, he puts in this riff from hell and changed the whole coloratura of it and had me screaming again at my age. <laughs> David's, um, David's vocal approaches, uh, he has many different uh, timbres to his voice, uh, many textures. I mean, as far as, you know, we've been talking about the, the real high stratosphere vocals, you know, one, and he's a total vocal gymnast in this area. And the, the, um, the sensitivity and almost caressing quality of his, uh, of his ballad approach, you know. When Jimmy first played the, uh, the introductory guitar riff to Shake My Tree, apart from the fact it was, what's he doing? It was this blur of fantastic fingers. That's what he rejoices in that I can't copy. Because I play a bit of, <laughs> I play a little guitar, you know, uh, but only for composition. But I do like to, uh, to think I'm a guitar stud, don't I, now and again. I go into flights of fancy when he slaps me around heartlessly <laughs> and coldly. And Something I rarely do is to let somebody play guitar on an album, but I did with David. Ow! I did with David. Me bracelet. <laughs> he encouraged me, in fact. He encouraged me. Uh, to play guitar on, on the record. And apart from it being a singular honor, uh, it was an absolute pleasure. We started in, in Vancouver laying down tracks, basically going for the drum tracks because the studio up there, Little Mountain, is exceptionally good, has a reputation for, for getting good uh, drum tracks. And of course, that's the backbone of the whole thing. After that, you're going to be layer layering on the extra instruments and voices. Um, but we actually went from Vancouver to Miami and it employed some of the local musicians down there, the local bass player, studio musician, and uh, also a keyboard player. And so those, those were the two from there. And then we just layered guitars and we, we got to the point where we were working 72 track with these different instruments plus Davis vocals, etc. The verse ideas and stuff for the song Waiting On You were a doddle. I'm just a meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts singer, other than the chest beating, the bravado. Um, but it came to the, what I would feel you, we could call a chorus line or a potential hook line. And there were all these weird ascending, descending, ascend I'm going, oh dear. <laughs> I said, that's the guitar solo, is it? That's a bit quick. <laughs> Unfortunately not. That was the hook line. And that completely and thoroughly evaded me for a while. And then one morning, quite seriously, one morning I just received a signal from God. And he said, just sing straight through it. And I called him up and confu <laughs> confused him by saying, I think I've got this great Motown lick for uh, <laughs> waiting on you. That's, he, yeah, he lumbers himself with this Motown lick. You know, <laughs> it has nothing to do with Motown. To oh, me. it's all this... He'll uh, still keep saying it. Listen, go on, go through no, it. No, no, he goes... Go no matter what you say, no matter what you do, this heart is dedicated. All that <laughs> stuff. I just see Diana Ross. Ross. Yeah. Honest to God, I want a, a pearl necklace and a wiggly butt. <laughs> but uh, I actually, so, you see, an assortment when, of wigs. When we uh, when we were working on this, David came up with the uh, the uh, melodies for the verse almost immediately. You know, it was just there. And uh, yes, the chorus had hung around for a little while. And I, I actually had a, a melody for it which I was holding back unless he really got stuck. And then when he, he came out with it... Well, suffer. That's right, absolutely. But when he came, when he came through with this melody, I, I, you know, it beat my one hands down, so that was really good, you know. No contest. <laughs> Jimmy is a sonic architect in terms of his structure. Uh, it's the most interesting... He is, without a shadow of a doubt, regardless of his legacy, the most interesting musician I've worked with uh, because of, he looks at the song as a song and how he can complement the theme of the song as a musician, as a guitarist. Uh, whereas a lot of uh, musicians use it as a, an excuse for showing off uh, technical expertise or whatever. Take a look at yourself. Um, 
going out of a chord sequence which I which which we'd worked on mm -hmm. in Tahoe but it was a it was more of the reflective feel of uh, take me for a little while and we I had one say. of them didn't we we have one of those <laughs> already <coughs> and it was during the, the period that we had in Barbados that uh, mm. David came up with another section to it and, and we tried it in a different uh, tempo and that's the way it went from the beginning of this project David and I were, were partners you know total 50 50 and we were going to produce the record ourselves between just the two of us but Mike Fraser the engineer who'd worked on Aerosmith projects in the past um, produced such a fine fine sound to what we were doing and also was helpful as far as a barometer in certain aspects as well that we decided at the end of the day to give him a, a co-production credit along with us but it was right at the end that we decided that but it was certainly on merit mm -hmm. over now uh, started off uh, one of Jimmy's crunchy malevolent dark uh, chord sequences and a particular groove uh, and tempo that is very appealing to me and I just felt this, the mood of the song was dark and uh, so I took a chapter out of of my particular life and we actually discussed because he's had the same kind of experience uh, when your when your actual partner isn't all they're meant to be and it takes a little bit of time for you to actually realize that and afterwards it's kind of an exorcism just to dispose of it you know by putting this by actually writing that kind of lyric so now that's it's over now mm -hmm. you know but this is a testament to a particular time feeling hot's one of those real fun rock and roll numbers yeah it's got all the energy that uh, was really there bubbling away within the writing period in those early stages i mean it's got all of that adrenaline pump and uh all the way through well what, what once we'd finished putting it together we were saying to each other well this would be a this is this is like the opening track when we do a live show you know it's just it's got all that energy and uh, it's a damn good track as well it's particularly for the style of music that we enjoy analog seems to to be able to handle the crunch the real dirty grungy stuff at the bottom end Hmm. which is no disrespect to digital equipment I mean it's magnificent uh, and the advent of CD has been a blessing for for any musician really because usually the last time you hear your work in how it ought to be heard is the last playback of the mix in the studio unless of course like him you've got your own studio uh, but it's it's wonderful uh, technology it's just that that's particular approach that we enjoy analog lends itself much more uh, as a pal, mm. isn't it? Then uh... it's horses for courses. If you're going to be uh, recording a, a a classical session, for instance, with a huge orchestra, mm. then you would go straight onto digital. But with all the overdubs that we were doing, we just felt it was better. But we and do it have a, to be. We do have a secret there, which we're not going to share. How we keep the signal so fresh, of course. Absolutely. Yes, and that is our secret for us to know and for you to ponder. That's why we're producers. In terms of in concert, uh, Jimmy and I have, have actually jammed in various blues clubs uh, whenever the, the mood has taken us and the, without any kind of announcement or whatever and the, uh, just the adrenaline and the rush has been incredible. All we do is, is suck that in and send it back. And it's indescribable, the rush that you can get from an audience because when you're a part of an audience, you're focused towards the stage. But when you're on the stage, you're on the receiving end of this enormous uh, wave of emotion and adrenaline. It's a v the most energizing experience I've ever had in my life. I think both of us feel that this has to be taken live. Mm. It really does. I mean, for, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we, we shook hands in New York just before we even sat down to, to see whether we could compose together and agreed that uh, if indeed everything did work, uh, work out positively, that we would take it, to, uh, take it to the street and feature slices of our careers. We will most definitely be featuring Zeppelin and Whitesnake and certainly 
as we're so very proud of the Coverdale Page album. I was just thinking about let's, let's make a really, really good record, mm -hmm. one that deserved to be made by the two of us. And we got the best out of each other without yes. any, any you know, denying of that. It's, it's a fact. There isn't anything on the record that can't walk off the disc and into the arena. Sure. We were a great inspiration to each other and very encouraging. A lot of people, I would imagine, with, uh, with Jimmy or myself, are somewhat intimidated because of, of whatever we've done. Uh, and we settled with each other immediately. And really, you know, in, uh, um, for me, it was an enormous inspiration to work with somebody I'd admired for so long and certainly learned from and copped from, too. Um, and it was, it was a treat. It was a, 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 the, the most refreshing experience I've had for a long, long time. I can see where I'm going there. 